I don't think that it would be useful to talk about the whole history of the Qumran community since uh, people have been throwing that back and forth from the beginning of this group existence and you guys have probably read some books or other on that subject. You may have read my books or you may have read Michael Bajan's book or you may have read Jim Tabor's uh, coming book or whatever. So I thought out of this document, since Jim and I were arguing or discussing the other night, this Damascus document, it might be useful to go through an interpretation of it here. <coughs> you may or may not know, and again, since everyone comes at this stuff from a different background, some people don't know a lot about this, some people don't know anything about this. It's just almost impossible to talk about these things with a mixed group of this kind and without boring a quarter or a half or a part of the people. In any case, for you who don't know about this, this document was originally found in Cairo in 1896 or 7 in a place known as the Geniza, which is a place that uh, is known to uh, deposit old manuscripts and particularly prayer books and uh, different things of that kind. You may or may not realize that the Jews felt you were not allowed to destroy a manuscript with the name of God on it, so it had to be either deposited or buried or something of that kind. Some people think the Geniza is a secret hideaway, but I don't think it's really secret. It's just a repository where old things were put. And this Geniza in Cairo was behind a wall in a synagogue in old Cairo. It was broken through at around the time the British got control of the, that area, the later part of the 19th century. And in there were a huge trove of manuscripts from the Middle Ages. The manuscripts haven't even been edited yet. Uh, our friend who's known in this field, Gold, Norman Gold has been working on these manuscripts for quite a while. <laughs> he claims he worked on them because he couldn't do Qumran scroll studies, but I have a feeling he just likes them. So I don't even think that it's because he can't do Qumran scroll studies. But a lot of us really couldn't do Qumran scroll studies as far as the new manuscripts, but there was plenty to do from the old manuscripts. So that really wasn't a serious problem, I don't think. In any fact, um, there, in any event, there are uh, for you who don't know the Guineas, I speak for the young ladies and others who may not know these things. There's a tremendous repository of manuscripts from the Middle Ages, uh, correspondence from Jewish communities all over the Mediterranean, as far afield as India and other places. So it's a treasure trove of uh, sociology for Jewish life in the Middle Ages, and many people <coughs> have used it like that, and it's still, as I said, has not been fully published. But among the finds there were these manuscripts that uh, seemed to go back to very old times that we'd never seen before. And the most important, several of these, the most important of these were the Damascus fragments. And everyone recognized at the time that these were revolutionary documents and um, something quite <laughs> incredible that we'd never seen. And I think people understood even in as early as the early 1900s that these were, in quotes, Jewish Christian documents of some kind. That depends what you mean by Jewish Christians, but uh, I think um, they saw elements of a familiar kind of material that Christianity had also somehow been involved in. So early commentators did see Jewish Christian aspects to it, and um, others, of course, may not have. This Jewish Christian thread in the Damascus document was lost as interest diminished in it over the first half of this century and people began to forget about this document. However, with the first finds in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was announced that there were fragments, particularly after Cave 4 was found, of the Damascus document in the Cave 4 materials. And so people began to treat the Cairo Damascus document found in 1896 as part of the Qumran materials. What you have in these books, like this old one of vermin and uh, your newer one there, uh, what you have in these, uh, this Vermesh book, what you have in Vermesh's translation is one of the only English ones. There's another one in Gaster, which uh, Gaster takes great liberties with the text. <coughs> Vermesh also takes liberties with the text, but his liberties are rather of a vo vocabulary kind. In other words, he steers clear of using familiar expressions. <coughs> if he can uh, say deeds or acts, he'll not say works. If he can say spirit of holiness, he won't say Holy Spirit. 
Uh, he wants to, whether consciously or otherwise, put you away from the very real connections with early Christianity that you have here. And uh, maybe it's in his mental framework himself, he doesn't see those connections, so he tends to, to translate words so that you miss some of the significant signification when looking at it within the framework of Christian vocabulary. That's my main, uh, uh, my main argument. Plus, he sometimes makes ludicrous, ludicrous translations, which even an uh, amateur like myself can see are ludicrous. And I don't claim to be a philologist. <laughs> One of the tremendous blunders he makes is in the Habakkuk commentary, what's called the Habakkuk Pesher, what I wrote that book upon. He translates a very important phrase body of his flesh. They inflicted the pollutions or the diseases as he calls it, but <laughs> they couldn't have inflicted diseases on him because they don't inflict diseases. But anyway, they inflicted some sort of polluting uh, ignominy on the body of his flesh, meaning the wicked priest's flesh. This is in the Habakkuk commentary, also in these collections here. And when you look at it over and over again, you realize that body of flesh is just the same word repeated twice. Flesh or body is basically the same word. What is he saying there? And when you go back to the uh, original Hebrew, the word is giviot. And giviot, in fact, you often means corpse. Well, when you change it around and translate it, they inflicted the uh, indignities of outrageous pollutions on the flesh of his corpse. The thing begins to make sense. Particularly if you think that uh, the wicked priest, as I think, is uh, probably or very likely one Ananus who was responsible for the death of James. And this Ananus, if you look at his death, and this is of course what led me to look at the material carefully, looking at the death of Ananus, and then say, well, what parallel could we have here? And then looking at Vermesh's translation, you could see no parallel until you realize that the body of his flesh was flesh of his corpse. When you saw it was flesh of his corpse, then it has every parallel in the world because if you read your Josephus carefully in the Jewish war, the Edomans come into Jerusalem and in, in the process of burning all the high priest palaces and wreaking some destruction at the behest of the revolutionaries in Jerusalem, they uh, kill many of the high priests, including Ananus, and Ananus in particular, they stand over and torment his naked body, Josephus says, and threw it outside the city without burial. So they inflicted indignities of a polluting kind on his naked body. And that helps. I don't say that that proves anything. I'm just saying that, that translations are very important for that. So you have to take Vermesh here with a grain of salt. However, since he is in English the most accessible translation and more precise than Gaster. Gaster's translations are just imaginary poetry. Uh, but they bear very little resemblance to the actual text. At the time Gaster was translating these things, I think he just wasn't in the field that much. If you know Gaster, and you know him, he was the son of the chief rabbi in England, Moses Gaster. He came from an illustrious English Jewish family. However, I don't think Dead Sea Scroll studies were his real, were his cup, and he did this as a kind of poetic exercise. His translation really is almost worthless. However, you can use it as a check on Vermesh. Occasionally it helps. If you don't know the original Hebrew, the best is go to the, take an English translation, go to the original Hebrew. If there's a word bothering you, you can use, you can make enough sense of the Hebrew from vocabulary lists and letter lists to translate it yourself to make sure that it's right. But never accept, if you're in a difficult passage, don't accept someone else's English translation. Never do it. You'll find it's almost always, you know, lacking. These translations that we did for Barr two months ago, we've got some letters back and some people object to our translation. They give their translations. And they're so arrogant, they think, oh, our translations are wonderful. You know, they give the editor of Barr their translation. I read their translations. If they think ours are bad, I don't know what they think of theirs. You know, ours may be bad, and we don't say ours are good. And I mean, I was working with Michael Weiss at the University of Chicago on these tr translations that, that we did, and of course, they pillared us, uh, as they will anyone who stands out on, on a limb. But they provide their own translations, which are, miss all the nuances completely. 
when there's a Jewish Christian phrase like the meek and the poor, <laughs> they translate it something like uh, the inferior or the self-conscious or something. They miss all of the really key phrases. They just have no sense of what these texts are about at all. But they've gone to a dictionary and they think they've got a more precise rendering from a dictionary, which are, which which doesn't help much at all. We try to use phrases that really relate to the history of this period as far as we know it. So let's look at this Damascus document. He starts off now, and I don't know if any of you have any books, but I'll read from the one I have. I'll just get as far as I can until you guys get bored. Here now, all ye who know righteousness, or all ye, I think how it's put, knowers of righteousness is what it is. And watch right from the start, they, if this is the legitimate start, by the way, again, for a sidetrack before we go any further here, this was the text that Philip Davies and I asked access to in 1989 to start uh, the ball rolling on this official dispute with the Jerusalem authorities here. We said, look here, you know, we can't proceed any further with our work without knowing if this Damascus document that you're, that you're talking about as being a Qumran document is parallel in the Qumran materials. And you're not showing us for 40 years the parallels, so how can we know if this is completely a Qumran document or it isn't a Qumran document? And so we said, Why, at least give us access to these fragments. Of course, we were ignored by Strugnell and uh, dumped on by Drury. And in fact, the reason why we're being treated the way we are now is because I wrote that letter to Drury in 1989. That is exactly why we're being, he never forgave us that letter that we wrote and we asked access to the Damascus document when we asked him to intervene. And he had just signed a contract with Strugnell. He had just signed a contract with Strugnell giving Strugnell absolute control of all of the material. So our letter for access totally embarrassed him in that in his judgment it was proper to sign a contract with this individual we now all know about. So we really did put him out on a limb there and he never forgot us, he never, he never forgave us. So in fact, indirectly, you're all getting the fallout from that particular letter. In any case, we asked them to do something and of course they didn't and that's when things started to really explode and accelerate as you probably followed the dispute more or less over the last couple of um, years, but the crux of the letter was, show us the palace of the Damascus document. Now we've got all the scrolls now, and we can see, and uh, what's his name, Wackolder from uh, Cincinnati has uh, restored particularly the Damascus document from the Concordance, but I have graves of his re restoration. He has one word <laughs> on a particular column, and then he restores the whole page from the Damascus document from the Cairo Ganesha. He restores the whole page, and you know, it really, you know, you see, it looks like in his book that he's got the whole document restored, but when you look at it carefully, he's just taken it from the Damascus document of the Cairo Geniza, and the Qumran parallels are almost minimal. So he's just, I'm not, not sure that his, I, I'm not qualified in a position because I haven't done the work to judge, but I just don't think that we have proved anything yet. From the <coughs> ones that I have seen, this, where we're starting, here you the knowers of righteousness, is parallel in the Qumran fragments, but it's not column one. We know it's not column one because there's a column to the right of it, <laughs> which is broken, so it's not column one. And say, oh, it's column two. No, we don't know it's column two, because we don't know how many columns we have to the right of it. I know there's a column to the right of it, at least one column to the right of it, in the document that we have from Qumran. And the rest is fairly straightforward from this first column you have in the book here. But I don't know what column it was at Qumran. It is parallel. But I have not seen parallels to lots of the other famous passages in this in this. Did you see the Geniza copy? Sure I've seen the Geniza copy. That's how, uh, this is the Geniza copy we're working for. No, no, I mean the original text in the Geniza copy. Sure, it's published by Schechter. <coughs> Anyone can see it. Yeah. Uh, so that started with column one, this, this particular here? You, yeah, this is column one from, from the Schechter right. Geniza. This is what everyone uses, right. Are the That's fragments what we're talking in about your about. facsimile edition? Yeah, sure, they're all in there. Everything from the Damascus, not the, not the Geniza is not in there. No, no. Everything from Qumran is in there. Everything. You've, you've had time to start looking at it. I told you, I've looked. Yeah. The That's last right. column, I can show you the last column. Right. Give me that. Give me the second volume of that, will you please? Yeah, I'll show you the last right. column. So this is not, the last column to. is not parallel. How do we know it's the last column? Because it is the last column. I mean, there's nothing after it, and there's blank after it, and the last column is not parallel at all. So I have no idea what the Qumran document really looked like. 
How's it going, Sam? Is uh, my handsome in there? You getting any good material in there? <laughs> <laughs> You're wasting your film, Sam. I mean, uh, you know. We gotta find a, uh, a full copy then. You gotta find lots of it. You won't find a full copy in, in this material. It doesn't exist. No, I mean in uh, Cave uh, 13 out there. Oh. <laughs> what? Cave 96. I tell you what, give me the other volume. Will you, Jim, please? Sure. Sleep is over here. I didn't mean to no. make you look it up. I just wanted to... No, no, absolutely. You had it's time to look at them already. Oh, I have looked at them, and I can tell you, frankly, that it's just as... I'm as puzzled as I was before. Yeah. So it hasn't helped me a lot to look at this. So we have had yeah. absolute parallel, which is... A, here it is. And we got several... several we got two, two, two versions of this. If I'll find the other one, I'll show it to you. This is the last column that a master's document. What number is it in that book? 815. There's several pictures of it in different, you know, you'll see it in several pictures. Because they knew it was important and they photographed it in several plates. And uh, you see it's, it's here, and then here, there's nothing. This is the last column. Here it is, it's the last column. And you can see it's the last column. But this column has words in common with pages in here, but it's not the same material. So I don't know. I really don't know. Gan, uh, uh, wacky, wacko, or we call him wacky. I call him wacky because I think he's wacky. <coughs> he thinks the Qumran scrolls were written in the eighth century B.C. So I mean, he's pretty wacky. But really? hell, we've been we we've been called wacky. So I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to throw stones at anyone else who's got weird theories. Everyone in this field has a weird theory. But wacko, you know, he's just way out in space someplace. But it doesn't matter. The, he doesn't know anything about Christianity, nothing about Christianity. The word actually sends shivers through his spine. He, whenever he hears the word Christianity, he starts to, to quake. In fact, when we published this messianic text, he was the one that attacked us in the press. Right. So he said, what do you mean, all you opponents of the establishment don't stick together? No, nobody sticks together in this field. Nobody. He's the one that attacked us in the press, said we had the wrong translation because he wants to distance the materials, Christian materials, from Judaism as far as he can. He doesn't want to admit anything Christianity has anything to do with uh, um, Judaism. So his psychological impetus is to say that's all bogus, there's no relationship. In fact, he, he, he wrote this in the, in the press immediately the same day that we published that, and he called AP and tried to attack us, called every columnist in America, tried to attack us, called New York, called Los Angeles, called everyone. I, I called him, I said, look, what holder? When you published your computer reconstruction, we applauded you. Well, I didn't think it was, in fact, moral that you should have ripped off something Strugnell gave you uh, on, in honor, but since you were, in fact, fighting a monopoly and so on, we did not, we, we withheld any kind of judgment of you in, in favor of solidarity of people who were opposing this consensus. Then when we do something, you run to the press and jump on it like this. To make a long story short, all of the establishment people who don't know anything, whoever attack us now, including Vermesh in England, just use what Wackholder says because they don't understand any more than Wackholder does and they just let Wackholder do the, do the work for them. So on that particular point, the thing that Wackholder tries to put, out, put forth is that the text doesn't say they killed the, they killed the, uh, the uh, leader of the community, the branch of David. He wants to say, <coughs> They killed him. No. He wants to say, he killed him. He killed him, the leader of the community of the branch of David. Hmm. Well, you know, you could translate it the way he is presenting it. But what we have said in that particular case, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's one, I, we don't think, he killed him, the leader of the community of the branch of David. That is, he has the leader of the community doing the killing. Now the whole thing is completely reversed, but the reason is he doesn't want to admit that there's a suffering messianic debt in the scrolls. And so he's changed the whole thing around, and that's what all of the establishment scholars have now done, which is fair enough. He may be right, but the point what we were trying to say is that there is no doubt that we have a messianic execution of some type being referred to in this text within the framework of familiar messianic prophecy. That's all we were trying to point out that the parallels with early Christian ideas about uh, a messianic prophecy are very strong in these Qumran texts. And here was one that was sat on for 35 years. We were not saying that we had the final reading. Now these are the kind of disputes you get into. And as I said, there's another version of that last column. I can't find it all offhand. It's a beautiful 
text. It's got ruled lines. It also is the end. You can see it's the end. The text stops in the middle of this column. And that parallels the one I just showed you. So the last column of the Damascus document, if in fact it is a Damascus document, it might be the last column of some other document entirely. It's just similar to the Damascus document. There's no way we can tell from what we have there if it's the last column of the Damascus document or the last column of some other document. But that's a beautiful text that I just showed you. And um, as far as the Damascus document goes, it's still up in the air as far as I'm concerned. Wackholder is showing from his, and it's not his own work, He's taking the concordance done by people like Fitzmaier and others in the 50s and 60s, 50s really, and <laughs> using their layout of the words and computerizing them and then mocking it up again and saying, oh, this parallels the Damascus document as we know it. He thinks it does. But the materials I've seen, to me, are still rather questionable, so I can't say I'm happy if it does. But some of the key passages of the Damascus document like the three nets of Belial or the righteous teacher being destroyed by some people running after him and the liar who spouts and so on and who removes the boundary marker and a lot of materials like that on fornication and so on are totally missing from the materials we have and there's no way to know if they're parallel or not. Let's go back to the document. Hear ye knowers of righteousness. Right from the first line, they announce the basic doctrine that we consider this sect or group or movement is all about the righteousness doctrine, Zedek. These are a group of people who know and care about righteousness and consider the works of God. Works, works, works. There he does use works. It is, like you were saying, uh, and cetera for Kabbalah. It is Ma'asim here that they are using, or the Ma'ase El, or etc. I don't have it right before me. In any case, works at Qumran are always Ma'asim. Ose, if you know Hebrew, is to do, to do. And the uh, uh, addition of the uh, Mem as a prefix makes it into doings or acts or works. In any case, they know righteousness and think about the works of God or weigh the works of God. In the Christian New Testament, you know the mighty works of God, mighty wonders and mighty works. In the War Scroll, too, we have the mighty works of God. I might tell you that in the New Testament, the mighty wonders and works of God tend to be little miracles that are done on a day-to-day -day level, like curings, healings, uh, making the blind see, and things like that, uh, exercising spirits, speaking in tongues making spirits go into flocks of, uh, of uh, animals and running off of cliffs, etc. In Qumran, this is not paralleled. In Qumran, the mighty works of God are warfare, are the great battles God has won for his people, the miraculous battles God. But the language of mighty works of God is parallel. It's just that it, I, in keeping with, I think, the total ethos of the, what the gospel seemed to me to represent, you have a much more Hellenistic... Um, personalized day-to-day -day meaning of these things in the gospel materials uh, that to me look like Hellenism uh, to you they may look like something else but whatever you whatever there are in the gospels there's no Hellenism here <laughs> the scrolls are just mighty zealot type Judaism of a most ferocious kind so I think we'll just carry on from there if you think they parallel or don't parallel the New Testament that's something you'll have to think about <coughs> Okay, and he has a dispute with flesh and will condemn all those who despise him. Again, Vermesh is not consistent here. This word despise is the same word I think that is used all through here, reject. And the word reject comes through vis-a-vis -vis the liar who rejects the law and the Habakkuk commentary in the midst of the whole congregation. So you should watch that word despise and, and reject. It is ma'as in Hebrew, reject. For when they were unfaithful and forsook him, notice the allusion to faith here, that there is an idea of faith, and here we have the unfaithful people forsaking God. He hid his face from Israel in his temple. So he says sanctuary here. I don't know why he says sanctuary. Why doesn't he say temple? These are the kind of things he does. Sanctuary. He is sanctuary. They, you know, his temple. He, he hid his face from his people in his temple. These are the tricks of the Vermesh translation. Be really careful of it. And delivered them up to the sword, and delivered them up to the sword. So every time that they did bad or were unfaithful, God punished them, not through the day-to-day -day miracles, but by, you know, destroying them in some way. 
But remembering the covenant of the forefathers, for Mesh says here, forefathers of the word is Rishonim. Here at Rishonim, the first. Remembering the covenant of the first. It's very important language at Qumran. The first, the first, and again parallel to the New Testament. Because the last is going to be also very important in this language here. We do have the first versus the last here, particularly in this Damascus document, but totally unrecognizable in New Testament terms. Because the New Testament, as you know, Jesus says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. We had a very famous governor in California who was fond of quoting that kind of scripture because he studied in a uh, seminary, Jerry Brown. He loved that, the last shall be first. He used to do it in campaign speeches and work up the people. But he was quoting it in a Pauline manner. Paul likes that language. Don't forget in um, uh, Corinthians, uh, when Paul lists the uh, uh, post-resurrection appearances of Christ, he speaks and he gives a kind of, uh, well, we think there's a, a conflation going on in that text because he speaks of first he appeared to Peter, then he appeared um, to the Twelve, then he appeared, and it goes on like that. And then he starts a new section of that where he says, then he appeared to James, then he appeared to the other apostles. We've well, already mentioned the other apostles in the Twelve when he was talking previously in that Corinthians passage. In any case, it finally ends up with, last of all, he appeared to me. I was last. I came when, and, uh, when, when uh, people least expected it or when no one expected it. Paul is the last. You have to understand that when you get the first versus the last terminology in gospel uh, allusions, it often <coughs> is, is, has to do with the polemic against the righteous teacher type people. For instance, we were arguing the other day, or discussing, you were, we were discussing Q, and you were showing me that parable where we have uh, Jesus going into the wilderness and <coughs> seeing 99 righteous ones in the wilderness and turns aside to rescue one sinner. That's paralleled in Galatians, where Paul says, you know, when the, when, the, when the people turn away in the second page and go over to the messengers of James who come down from J Jerusalem, and then Paul says, uh, you know, even though we are not Gentile sinners, and so on and so forth, the sinner language is often a, a, a lead motive for Gentile. And uh, to be in favor of the one sinner is often to be in favor of the whole Gentile movement as opposed to the righteous ones like Qumran in the wilderness. This is kind of complex, I know, but you have to watch the polemics of the language uh, that, you, uh, that you have. So when you get a word in the uh, Damascus document talking about the first, and so I know Jim Tabor likes to catalog what are the parallels here to Christian language, you have in this document, you're going to come on to the last, the last is us, living now in the last times, the last generation, when the last things are happening. And the first, they were the forefathers. They were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the others who gave the law. And later on in this text, you're going to have the first setting down the law, putting the boundary markers, and the new covenant comes to consolidate once again or reaffirm what the first did. But the liar, the spouter of lying, removes the boundary markers which the first set down that is, which the Rishonim, or the ancestors, and so on, set down. All this is implied by, uh, by Ramesh's language, the forefathers here, but you just have to be very careful not to think it says forefathers in the Qumran <coughs> school. The language is the first versus the last. And uh, the language of first versus the last in the scrolls is quite different than the New Testament. But the change in the New Testament is in a systematically recognizable kind that is once again we are moving over into a different signification for the first verses, the last. The last in the New Testament are people of the Pauline frame of, of, of our mind, but they shall become first, and the righteous sort of uh, snobbish uh, folks who keep the law and think that they're more important and that they're more righteous and so on and so forth, or they were in the movement first, or the original apostles or others, the so-called arch apostles that Paul speaks about in the Corinthians, correspondent, not that their importance means anything to me, Paul says, etc. These are more like the first in the movement, and as Jesus says, they shall be last and the last shall be first, switching over to the Pauline scheme of things. That's how I see it anyway. So watch the language of the first shall be last. It's in Qumran, it's in the New Testament, but with entirely different signification. He left a remnant to Israel, that is, remembering the covenant of the first, and did not deliver it to be destroyed. Then we come to the Age of Wrath that we discussed last time, so we don't have to go in this, 390 years. 
after he had given them over to the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. We're, we are tracing Jewish history very quickly here. Notice how quickly we traced it. First, we talk about the covenant of the first. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and maybe Moses. Then we're already to the Babylonian destruction. Then we're into 390 years. We've already discussed that the 390 is probably has to do with the, the, the uh, numerology of Daniel. And that the 390 years is probably not precise because these people did not have a calendrically precise uh, uh, sense of time, at least after the fall of the first temple. They probably had a better sense of time from the time of David down to the fall of the first temple because of the accurate records that they had than they had thereafter. So the 390 years is a real stumbling block for understanding this text. And it comes up right here because it makes people think that we are in 390 years after 600. That is, or 590, or 585, whenever you think uh, you're giving the precise date of the fall of the temple. So take 390 from 585, and what do you get? Um, about 195 or 200 or something like that. So people said, oh, we're coming into the Maccabean period here. And the whole interpretation of the scrolls has from that point on been the Maccabean period. There were psychological and other predispos predispositions for it, but the whole interpretation of the scrolls has been the Maccabean period, largely because of the reference to 390, but very few people have really understood, and I'm not saying this out of uh, self-interest or self-servingly, <coughs> very few people have really understood that the 390 is not really understood accurately, but as a prophetical uh, allusion. Now, as another part of the 390, again, if you look at Ezekiel, who's a very important prophet to the writer of this text here, and as you see when we get into column 4, you'll see how important he is. 390 was the amount of time, as I said the other night, that Ezekiel's tongue <coughs> clung to the roof of his mouth after the destruction of the temple. Exactly this destruction here. Exactly this destruction here. If you know the prophet Ezekiel, he hears in a miraculous way that the temple is destroyed and he cannot prophesy. His tongue clings to the roof of his mouth 390 days. So I think we're talking not only symbolically but uh, within Daniel but also Ezekiel here. 390 years before what happens? Prophecy starts again. That's really what the 390 is about here. Before prophesying starts again. It doesn't matter. Well that was days. This, this is years. More or less. They don't care. It's the 390 that matters to them. It doesn't matter days, years, months, or, 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 or whatever. It's the numbers that matter. Okay, so now, he, anyway, it was 390 years after he gave them over to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Notice when they, not worried about someone, they mention his name. And there's another text here. It's a bit stuffy in here. You want to open that door so folks, or open this window here so folks don't die, because uh, this is pretty heavy stuff for doing it in a stuffy room. And if anyone wants to walk out while I'm talking, that's fine, because this is pretty abstruse stuff, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bore anyone or put anyone to sleep, huh? Because I admit this is heavy stuff, and it can be pretty boring if you're not interested in it. So you wouldn't embarrass me at all if you do walk out. Um, look, there's a text called the Nahum Commentary, the Nahum Pesher. Many of you may or may not have read it. It's also in this collection, and for the neophytes, obviously, they've never heard of any of this stuff, and I just can't go through it all in one lecture and make you an expert instantly on the scrolls. But uh, the Nahum Pesher does mention known people. Metrius it talks about. And we think it means Demetrius, king of Greece. And that is someone Josephus does refer to and seems to be in the period of Alexander Yanias, who was the Maccabean, the third Maccabean king generation after Judas Maccabee and his brothers, then John Hyrcanus, then Alexander Yanias, bringing us down to about 100 BC. And um, you see, it is not, the scrolls are not shy of mentioning people, and I always <coughs> emphasize it over and over again, who are ancient history. Mm -hmm. And in that Nahum Pesher, again, are what I call dumbbell scholars run and say, look, <coughs> the scroll mentions, mentions Demetrius, and it seems to be talking about Alexander Yanias, and so on. Scrolls are written in the Maccabean period. Again, total nonsense. Mentions Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> total nonsense. It usually means that's past history, because mm -hmm. the scroll people knew their history as well as Josephus did. You have to understand. Josephus probably stayed with these people. He talks about spending three years as a neophyte out in, in, in the wilderness, if you read his work closely in his autobiography. And he very probably spent time with this group. They know history at least as well as Josephus did. They're not stupid. They may not know their chronology well. But they do know their, uh, their, their history. So <coughs> they are not shy of mentioning past histories. But 
the present generation where their weird code comes into play, righteous teacher, wicked priest, and other things. Okay, and so there sprang, uh, he visited them, God visited them. That is the meaning here. I think it's in, in, in unavoidable. What do we mean by God visited the earth? Do we mean immaculate conception or something like that? I don't know what they mean here, but the very point is we have it in another text that Jim is familiar with that we just published. God visited them. God visited them in, I forget which text was that that we had the visiting again, Jim, that we just published. Was it in the, the that Messianic text or the or the war prayer? One of the two of those. Anyway, yeah, I think it was, in, it was in the Messianic yeah. text that we just published in Bar. So we know two texts talking about God visiting, God visiting the earth. What way will God visit the earth? Hey, I'm not a preacher, I don't know. But I think in the war scroll, it's quite clear that they're preparing for the visitation. It's mm -hmm. quite clear the war scroll, and I can't read all these texts to you. I'd love to do it. It takes me about half a three-month three course to do it in, and I can't do it in one hour or even, you know, impose on your patience for much more than that. But the point is that um, in the war scroll, they are waiting in the wilderness. If you look at it carefully, look at column if you're interested. The Roman numerals here are the mm -hmm. column numbers. Look at column XI, column 11 of the War Scroll, and you'll see in that column the most incredible stuff where the Messianic prophecy also <coughs> um, analyzed or interpreted in the Damascus document here and also interpreted in the Messianic proof text from Qumran. The Messianic prophecy, Numbers 24, Star shall rise out of Jacob, a scepter shall to rule the world. That is analyzed in terms of Daniel 7, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. It mm -hmm. is analyzed in a messianic way, <coughs> and the whole point of it is that the heavenly host, led by the Messiah, will come down from heaven, join their camps, and fight on their side in the final apocalyptic war against all evil on this earth, first in Palestine and then the world, to eradicate all the sons of darkness, all evil from the earth. This is a holy uh, army. It may be uh, um, uh, uh, allegorical, that text, as our establishment scholars tried to say in per perpetrating or perpetuating their Essene theory. But I think if anyone who reads the War Scroll, it's just a, I think that the writer is a bad writer, but I don't think it's an allegorical <coughs> text. He just is writing, he's never fought. He's so busy telling what slogans you're going to put on the trumpets, just like this chap up in Jerusalem that you've all seen. Uh, but, his, the, but the slogans on, on his trumpets, I love to read them through the war scroll because the slogans are quite incredible. And they're, they're very Zionistic, uh, wild, uh, sort of more like Cromwell's uh, onward Christian <laughs> soldier type army than anything our chap up here in the, in the restoration of the Third Temple trumpets ever even imagined. I mean, you could even put them on, uh, I think, missiles and atomic bombs if you, were, uh, if you were preparing that kind of army. But I think he just was, as I said, the fellow who wrote the war scroll just uh, wasn't used to fighting. He was an armchair warrior, so it looks maybe it was an imaginary war, but not, not, not in his mind. In his mind, this is really going to happen. This is a real war fighting there. He just didn't happen to be much of a warrior himself, so if he had come up against Roman troops with that scheme, he'd have been an, uh, annihilated, which in fact they were. So <laughs> it doesn't surprise one that given the battle plan of the kind outlined in the war scroll that they came to grief. But never mind, the pious enthusiasm of that scroll is incredible to behold. And the whole point again of column 11 is to interpret the messianic prophecy in terms of Daniel, son of man, coming on the clouds uh, of heaven, heavenly host coming down to fight in these people's camps because these people are so pure, and that's the point of their purity in the desert, are so pure that the angels will not fear to tread in their camps. If they are not, if they are polluted, if they are fornicating, that's why if we have uh, drinkers and fornicators like we have in this group here, in our camp here, the heavenly host, and that's no aspersion, I'm happy to have no, all forget, kinds of people in no, this camp here. Right, 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 right. In any case, if, the, if, you are, if you are, you know, polluted in any way, then the, the heavenly host will not, would not come and fight for you. The heavenly host would not join your camps. Why? Because they would not be able to go back up to heaven when they were done. Because you would have polluted them with manly, earthly, or womanly, earthly pollution. And I, and I say, where did they get this idea? I don't know. I wasn't in their brain. I don't know where they got this idea. But they did have this idea that, this, that these people were going to come down and the Messiah was going to be part of that. And um, I think, why am I talking about that? This heavenly visitation. 
Now, some people say this visitation is the is the uh, uh, procreation of some seed, some messianic plant, some messianic root, some messianic shoot. Also possible, but whether that in also entails a doctrine like the Son of God, I that I think we have to draw the, the line on here. I don't. I can I can conceive that they thought that there was going to be some heavenly planting here of some kind uh, that had some miraculous or supernatural meaning to it. Uh, but whether this meant an actual son of God in the Hellenistic Zeus type sense, I don't think that was in their vocabulary. Which is why they just speak here of a messianic, uh, uh, of a visitation. I think it is messianic because the plant springs from Israel and Aaron. And later on we speak about the Messiah or Messiahs from Israel and Aaron. So he visits them and caused a plant root to spring. You do have some indication of what a lot of you are interested in, a generation of a messianic figure in the first column of the Damascus document, right off. Uh, so he does visit the earth and there is a generation of some planting and the plant root symbolism, as you know, is very messianic symbolism from Aaron and Israel, later referred to in this document as a, as a messiah or messiahs. And this plant or root is going to inherit his land and prosper on the good things of this earth. And then they saw their that their, their guilt, he says, iniquity, and recognized that they were guilty men. I have to say, they perceived their iniquity and recognized they were guilty. <laughs> they saw that they were sinners and they repented of their sin. And if you want to go over to the community rule, it's the same kind of thing going on in the community rule. And it's the same kind of thing in the early Gospels, that uh, John preached away in the wilderness and uh, he preached forgiveness of sin in, in the wilderness. Here, basically, it, it's not the same vocabulary, but it's exactly the same thing. They saw their sin and recognized that they were guilty men, i.e., they repented. They saw their sin and they repented. Let's put it in familiar language, and it is exactly parallel to what we know from other quarters as far as language goes. Whether the meaning is the same, I can't tell you. Here's the 20 years problem that I told you about before. I don't want to dwell on it again because uh, I'm we're never going to get very far in this text if I do. So they were like blind men groping for the way, the way, another important vocabulary, uh, terminology of this group, the way, the way, the way, all through the Damascus document, community rule, we have the way, and the way symbolism, and of course in the New Testament, and uh, the word in Hebrew is derek, and I think you have to understand that in the book of Acts, Christianity is called the way. People often ask, what was the name? Christianity went by in Palestine before it became Christianity overseas. One of the names, anyway, is the way. And any way symbolism or terminology is important. Now, God observed their deeds. Now, up above, he said, they know righteousness and consider the works of God. And here he said, God observed their deeds. It's exactly the same word as above. Why does he change the translation? You ask Worm. I don't know why he changes the translation, but he does. And I think it's to confuse you because he doesn't want to show you the consistency of the vocabulary here. It should read, and God observed their works. Ah, but if God observed their works, we're getting into dangerous territory. If God just observes your deeds in English, we're not in any dangerous territory. It's just a lot of hocus pocus. But works, we all know the significance of works righteousness, and we're in familiar terrain again. Yes, it's the same as above that he did translate works, ma'asim. Here he translates it as deeds. Now the above is God's, <coughs> God's works, this is man's work. So God watched their works, and that they sought him with a whole heart, and then he raised up for them a teacher. Now notice, the, the teacher, if it is true that we're right here, comes 20 years after the root of planting. And the root of planting may be the community itself, but the community certainly had a leader. And it looks like the community, and it comes 20 years after the visitation of God on this earth, in some way. God visited the earth in some way. And it looks like, you know, we have a... The 20 years is the only problem I've ever had with this text and putting it into a, Jew, a Jewish-Christian framework. And the problem I've dealt with there is uh, if it is a James-type teacher, I don't say it is, uh, then, you know, we have a break of some 20 years before he takes over and, and takes control of things. Again, I, I don't want to get too specific here, uh, but we know that James did control things from the 40s to the 60s certainly in the 50s and 60s in Jerusalem. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it doesn't relate to that, it could relate to something else, but if it relates to something, what else it might be, at least in known events that it might be. And of course our ordinary uh, establishment uh, consensus come run scholars 
never answer any of these questions because they never feel obliged to interpret the text at all. Since they only rely on archaeology and paleography, it absolves them from interpreting anything in, in the text. They never get out on a limb, so they never can be pillared. So since they don't give any uh, analysis, they say, well, what do they say about these things? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. They don't identify anyone. They don't give any historical identification to anything here, and therefore they can't be criticized. So it's the safest of safe positions to take. Well, in any case, may not relate to the James person, but if it does, I told you I had a feeling that the Jesus event might have come a little earlier than most of us think it did, and I expressed that to you the other night, and I gave you the reasons from uh, Eusebius, the fact that the Acti Palati of Eusebius, and that's also in Robert Eisler, I'm not the only one to have seen that, the Acti Palati seemed to talk about the Jesus m m material uh, coming in the, in the teens or the 20s. If that's the case, then I'm home free with the James thing. If it isn't the case, then this 20 years is something of a problem, and I don't uh, deny that it, it is, but I'm not prepared to give you an interpretation. I don't know what it might be. It seems like the 20 fits your theory well. Could be, but let's go on, because I don't want to argue it now. I've just told the folks here what the problem is, if you can figure out a, a, an analysis of it. I admit a weakness there. And I'm, I'm but if, proud. The, if the plant was in 30 and James is in 30, Okay, well, let's leave it. I don't, I don't want to speculate at the moment. I think the evidence is better in some other place. Let's leave it, Jim, for the moment. The point is I want the I folks... I want another problem. No, I, I just want the folks, folks to think about it themselves. Let them well, maybe they don't know it. Well, I just told them to. Don't so think about it. No, no, let's go on. <laughs> 30 and 20 is 50, you said he rose I'm going to keep going, and we'll argue about it later on. <laughs> I, I don't want it to fit my theory. I want to be nice. I want to be nice and say there are things that are weak here. Fine, that did not fit my theory. you got a better theory. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. Okay. I don't... Uh, we, we, let, let, let's go on. 20 years is, is a problem that you should have to wrestle with whether it's accurate, and it's well, one of the reasons we wanted to see this text. Is that parallel in the extant materials that come run? Yeah. Right. My name is Millick, my name is Strugnell, my name is DeVoe, my name is Cross. I'm not interested in such things, therefore I don't think I have to show you the, these materials. You can wait another 100 years before you <laughs> ask that question, because I'm a great mind. <laughs> and that was the answer that they gave us for 40 years. Okay, now we've published the stuff. They say, oh, you're bandits, you're criminals, you're thieves. The hell, the hell you say. We are interested in looking at the material. We're not one of your careers in great universities and all this kind of stuff. So we published this stuff, and now you can look, and the problem is, is still there, because, in fact, I don't know if the 20 is proud of the extant text or it isn't. But it is an interesting point. 390 to me is no problem. The 20 is. Okay, God observed their works, etc., 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 and he raised up a teacher of righteous. Notice this text talks about the righteous teacher for the first time. Now, I'm not going to have time to go through more than three or four columns of this text the rate I'm going, and you're going to get fed up, so that's all I'll do. But you can begin to see a macrocosm, a microcosm, a macrocosm, when we do a text like this. My friend Gold, my friend Gold, he says these are texts thrown in the caves, helter skelter from libraries, quote. Norman Gold was a good friend of mine. He is a delicate, elegant human being, very sensitive man. The people in the Haaretz newspaper wrote him up very nicely. They didn't put him with, uh, they didn't put him with, uh, what's this movie director's name that they stuck Mazursky. us with? They didn't make a laughing stock of him by putting him with uh, Paul Mazursky. They elegantly gave his theories in four pages with all kinds of beautiful shots of him from different perspectives and lighting and so on. And Gold came home with the Haaretz article clutched in his hand and immediately faxed me it because he was thr so thrilled the way Haaretz had presented him. Us, they presented as clowns. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that my friend Gold does not read the texts. And he's not interested in the text any more than the establishment people are. Because here is an example. The teacher of righteousness is mentioned in this text, in another text, in a third text, in a fourth text, in a fifth text, in a sixth text. The liar is mentioned in this text, in another text, in another text, in another text. Um, the wicked priest goes from text to text to text. Forget the dramatis personae, the concepts, the way, <coughs> the works, uh, the perfection, uh, the righteousness doctrine. I mean, over and over, the star prophecy. Across the board, text after text is referring <coughs> to the same thing. Therefore, uh, we have to say that the material is almost, there are variations, of course. Because there are slight variations, does not rule out the fact that different people in a given movement have <coughs> slightly different ways of thinking. Everyone thinks in a Dumbo way about the past, or a Dumbo way about the past. 
you go to the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, and he's got a whole bunch of people writing there, let's say, in his ideological uh, movement, that doesn't mean every one of his writers is going to have exactly the same doctrine about what he's talking about or what they're involved in. Some are going to be more militant, some less militant, some more violent, some much more pacifistic. There are going to be uh, differences of opinion about doctrine. There's all going to be all kinds of gradations. And we have some of that in the Cumberland text, but on the whole, the material is homogeneous. The voc vocabulary is homogeneous. Conceptuality is homogeneous. I mean, in the sectarian text across the board. So there's no way to say this is just a sordid library from Jerusalem. This is the library of a movement. Now, it may come from Jerusalem. Gold may be right, quite right there that the majority of these materials may have been written in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Church of James the Just, as far as I'm concerned, is, fits that theory quite well. I'm, I can live with the Jerusalem origin of the Cumberland materials. We do not have to have a little monk with an inkwell sitting down here in this little room over here penning 50,000 documents. So it doesn't matter where these things came from or how they got here. What does matter is do they hang together? Is the material homogeneous? The material is rather homogeneous on the whole messianic, nationalistic, xenophobic, the whole retinue of, of what it is. And I think in that score we have the literature of a movement here. You cannot escape this as a movement. Now what kind of movement? A little movement out in the wilderness contemplating its navel, unimportant politically and, politi <coughs> and, and spiritually in its time? No, I don't think so. It's not an isolated movement. It is a very great movement, very powerful movement. The mass of literature we found here certainly illustrates how massive and important the movement was. And I think it is a very popular movement. I agree with Gold, it's a very popular movement uh, as well. But is it popular Judaism of the day? Insofar as the Messianic zealot opposition movements opposed to the unpopular Herodian Pharisee establishment were popular, yes, it's the popular literature of the day. But it still is the literature of a movement. Is the Ayatollah popular in Iran? On the whole, yes. Does he have enemies? Yes. Are there groups in Iran that oppose him? Yes. But does he represent the mass of the people? Probably he does. I would say the righteous teacher here is that kind of figure. And even though the righteous teacher is not in control, even though the Shah of Iran or the Romans are in control or the Herodian extensions of that leadership and their further extensions within the Jewish commonweal, the Pharisees and parties like the upper class Sadducees allied to them are in control through military power here, that does not mean that that's the popular movement among the people. One of my objections to the gospel and New Testament criticism generally is that I agree that Jesus or the Messiah or whoever is the messianic figure of the time was a popular leader. He was a popular leader and that's one of the reasons for his elimination because he did move masses of people and he was popular across the broad breadth of the countryside and was responded to by large numbers of the common simple uh, simple people, if not the establishment. You cannot then transfer that into an accusation that the Jews killed Christ. The Jews cannot kill their own popular leader. You can't have it both ways. You can't have them followed by masses of people in, in the countryside and then make an accusations that the Jews killed Christ. It's like saying that the Americans killed John Kennedy. Americans didn't kill John Kennedy. A small group or a single group or a, a bunch of uh, a clique of people did, but the American people were largely for him. Same thing for these messianic leaders. The mass of the people were for them. I think the same thing for this literature here. I think it's a very popular movement. I certainly think it's messianic, and I agree that it is a kind of popular Judaism, but the popular Judaism of a movement that was opposed to the establishment. It is not just any old literature. For instance, it's not mm, literature out of Pharisee libraries. It's not literature out of upper-class Sadducee libraries. It's not literature out of Herodian or Roman libraries. It's literature out of opposition libraries, all with the same basic point of view. So I think we can go on from there a little bit. I won't talk much longer, I think, because I can see it'll go on all night. Okay, and he may do, anyway, he, he raised the teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way. There's the way terminology again, twice. First they grope for a way, then they have find the way, and now the way is the way of his heart, meaning either God or the righteous teacher's heart, it's difficult to say. And he made known to the later generations, here's the late versus the first, you see the first versus the last? Now we're in the latter generations, the last generations, so we've got the first last terminology in the first column of the Damascus document, but it's quite different in the New Testament as we know it. That which God had done for the last generation, the congregation of traitors, 
So we have a traitors. Do we have traitors in the New Testament? Sure we do. Who's the traitor par excellence? Judas, who betrayed him. We have the traitor terminology in both, but it is different at Qumran, slightly different. I don't accept the Jude stuff any way, shape, or form. To me, that's pure anti-Semitism. The very name, Judas the traitor, is Jew traitor, and it's come down in our history from beginning to end. I just do not believe that material in the way it's presented us. You must forgive me. I get passionate about that because I take the Qumran as my guide stick. Qumran is using the traitor language, and to me, it's trivialized in those presentations. And particularly, I know that the, the Judas the traitor is a popular one. I reject it. But it may be that you're right and I'm wrong on this, and I don't want to be dictatorial. I'm just telling you what I feel. And we all can feel whatever we want, and you feel what you feel, but I'm giving you what I feel on this. And we have the traitor language here. It's all through the scrolls. It is, it is part of the movement. It is in the Habakkuk commentary. It's in the Psalm 37 commentary. It's in all through the scrolls. Here we have it, the traitors the traitors, that's serious accusations because they hate the traitors. These people do not love their enemies. They hate their enemies. And they hate the sons of the pit. And they hate the unrighteous. And they want to ex they want to eliminate them. They want to eliminate them. There's no love lost on enemies in this literature. Again, another divergence, though I think in a typically systematic way, the divergences pile up here, but always the same concepts are being wrestled with, but often reversed. Anyway, so they made known in the last generation what had been done to the last generation of the congregation of the traitors. And who are the traitors? Not Judas Iscariot. The traitors are the departers from the way. And what is the way? The way in the community rule is the way of the study of Torah. Now, I'm not advocating necessarily that you study Torah. It's up to you. And you know me. I'm not a very good Torah person. Uh, but I want to understand this particular group. So uh, the fact of the matter is that the way is the study of the law. This way is the study of the law. The departers from the way we are going to get here are allied to the liar. The traitors and the liar are together. And that's exactly the same in the Habakkuk commentary. So then people tell me, this is 2nd century BC, Mr. Cross says. This is 2nd century BC document. How come, Mr. Cross? Oh, because one fragment which I never showed you has a 2nd century BC script that I identified as 2nd century BC script. Therefore, that is a 2nd century BC uh, document, Mr. Cross. How do you know that the person who was using the 2nd century BC script, if you have identified it correctly, was not just using a classical script style and happened to be a very uh, trended uh, um, um, scribe and uh, was not writing it in the 1st century BC? Mr. Cross does not answer that question. So we have the whole theory of the dating of these scrolls built up on the level of paleography. And I answered all that in my book, Maccabees, Zadokites, Christians, and Qumran. Now, I asked for the carbon dating. What did the Jerusalem establishment do? It's sort of like in Jesus' days, you know. They then used the carbon dating against me and others by trumpeting the results that they got. But the whole, the whole caveat that we gave to our friend Drory, who's down here pounding us again, and we are putting ourselves in a position to be pounded, and I shan't put myself in that position again with him, the whole caveat that we gave when we demand or asked Drury to do the carbon-14 testing of Qumran manuscripts was that opposition people be included in the process. What does our friend Mr. Shank say? Mr. Shank says, I didn't mean demanded to be included in the process. I didn't demand to be included in the process. I said that the process would be useless if opposition people were not involved in it to signal what text they consider worth dating. But our friends didn't care what text they dated because they were not interested in confirming or denying our theories. Therefore, they dated a whole list of rather useless texts. The Damascus fragments were not dated. The Habakkuk Pesher was not dated. The Nahum Pesher was not dated. The War Scroll was not dated. All the texts that they dated were rather uninteresting. And then they trumpeted that they had disproved our theories and proved the Essene theory. And that was the way information is managed in this field and continues to be managed. Well, we would have dated this text because we would like to know from Cross's paleography whether the old fragment of the Damascus document really differed from the Habakkuk commentary. You say, what are you talking about? The Habakkuk commentary also mentions the traitors and the liar. Now, if the Habakkuk commentary that we have dates to the first century, and we think it does, and this text came out to carbon date to the second century BC, the old handwriting style of the Damascus doc document, we would be in a kind of a problem. But I cannot conceive 
that two texts talking about the same characters would carbon date that far off. Anyway, we'd like to see these things. That's why we wanted to be in on the process. We were not on the process. They didn't consult us, didn't ask us, and don't care about us. So the results that they have piped around the world, we don't accept. I just got finished writing an article to our friend Herschel Shanks in Washington, D.C., uh, correcting all of the mistakes he made, talking about my ideas about paleography, and that'll be printed in the next one. And in fact, in the space of about two pages, he made it to 13 mistakes. I mean, uh, this is from friends. So if you get that kind of treatment from friends, I mean, God knows what you can expect from enemies. You can imagine what this silly field is like. I mean, it's actually, it's best to get out of this field if you can. <laughs> it just brings you to grief, huh? Let me just finish this up and let you folks go. I want to just go into the uh, into the second <coughs> column. I'm not going to obviously get past the first column. I wanted to go into the three nets of bilial, but it is, as you see, rather hopeless. And my classes are something like this, aren't they, Dennis? We go on like this, and it takes us. I know there's a lot of guys who teach at universities, and I hear about them all of the time. They never come to class, and they're busy doing their research, or they're translating some text, and, and then their students are all waiting for them, and they, and they just don't seem to get through a whole class with their students. And yet they become very famous scholars because they've published this magnum opus of some kind. That may be good and that may be right, but I must say what we do in our classes, good or bad, is we do go through these texts and it takes us a good year to go through them because we go through them page by page, the way we're doing now. We really go through them page by page. And to do through that just takes a lot of time. Now you always should be careful of people who talk about a text abstractly and don't read you page for page from it because they're often re saying things about the text that they're not proving from the text. If a person can go through the text with you page for page and show you what it is he or she is talking about, I think you're on pretty safe ground in being able to follow and see if in fact it's in the text. So I, I would uh, think it takes this kind of time to go through these things. A good reading of this document, the Damascus document, I think takes, the way we're doing it, about five hours. Habakkuk pressure takes about three. The war scroll you can do much faster, the community rule you can do much faster. So to do a class in these things, you need around, you need a good, uh, you know, 20 or 30 hours just to go through the, the text, forgetting about the historical background. But let's read a little bit more of this here. Okay, so he made known to this last generation, congregation of traitors, those who departed from the way. This was the time which is written, a quotation from Hosea, stubborn heifer was Israel, she was stubborn, etc., etc., etc. Then we have the allusion to the scoffer. By the way, scoffer is Vermesh's language. The actual language is Latson, and it looks to me, I don't know where he gets scoffer from, it's jester or comedian. And I think it's better word, comedian, because I think it's kind of a joke, and this guy is a joker. A, jo a certain joker, like you were talking about, a comedian. This guy, I took him so seriously, but he was a joke. <laughs> I don't think it's a scoffer as such. It's kind of a Latson. It's a kind of scoffer. I mean, it's a kind of comedian. In any case, a comedian arose. What did this comedian do here, or this joker or scoffer, if you prefer? That, by the way, is in several texts, this, this, this personality. Again, the Habakkuk commentary, paralleling the Damascus document on every phrase here. He shed, or he poured, poured is the word, he poured, like baptismally pouring waters. And later on, he's called the pour out of, not waters, but the pour out of lying, the Matif HaKazav. Here, he is the Latson who pours out the waters of lies. He pours out lying. Now, in <laughs> the conventional interpretation of Qumran scrolls, this person is one of the Maccabees, and he's also identified with the wicked priest. And it's quite <laughs> obvious that the liar and the wicked priest are totally different people. And you can see that yourself. I think I was one of the first people to make that very, very clear. I to get the credit for that, okay. Uh, in any case, it's here. I, see, I made it clear because I thought the people of the establishment knew that. It was only when they started criticizing my work that I realized I didn't even know the liar and the priest were different people. And any idiot first grader could read the text and see that they're two different people being talked about here. But the liar is an ideological adversary within the movement. Because they identify the liar with the wicked priest, they have this liar leading a whole city and being responsible for untold <coughs> evil and killing people and all kinds of other things, when in fact his only sin is that he pours out lies over the people. Uh, but he pours it out like a kind of water. And in pouring out the lies in a kind of water over the people, he removes the, the boundary markers. He removes the law which the first had set down. He's a traitor to the new covenant and the old covenant. 
because he denies, as the Habakkuk commentary says, and also about the liar, the law in the midst of the whole community or the whole congregation. Anyway, here we have him introduced for the first time. He poured over Israel the waters of lying, and in doing so, he doesn't kill a lot of people. He doesn't do <coughs> political things. He's a spiritual teacher. He, what he does is deny the law. His whole doctrine is against the law. And in doing so, he caused them to wander in a trackless wilderness or a waste, bringing low the everlasting heights, i.e. the laws of the first, abolishing the ways that the laws of the first are called the ways of righteousness, again, the Darche Zedek, and removing the boundary markers, removing the boundary markers, which the forefathers, again, the word forefathers, the first, the Rishonim, the first, we're in the last generation, they were in the first, they set down these boundary markers, had marked out as their inheritance, and therefore God calls down on them the curses of his covenant and delivered them over to the avenging sword of the covenant. I feel we're in the Roman period, and the Roman sword is coming in to take its vengeance on those who have removed the boundary markers. It's all very complex. In any case, uh, it is quite clear that the illusion what the liar is doing is, one, he's pouring out like water over the people, lies, and those lies in, uh, involve denying or removing uh, the law. In any case, then God responds by bringing the avenging sword on them, and they chose some more scriptural passages here from Isaiah. One of the things which these wicked people do is, they justify the wicked. They make the wicked righteous. And again, we have the first allusion to justification theology. Thanks to Vermesh, he doesn't change the word justify here. These people justify the wicked and condemn the righteous. That is opposite to the natural order of justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked. Now, this is the, uh, the, the dichotomy between Rasha'a and Zadik. Rasha'a and Zadik evil and righteousness, condemnation and justification. Later on, when we start talking about the sons of Zadok in column four, what the sons of Zadok do well is <coughs> they set tables right. They justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And the sons of Zadok are almost like supernatural beings. They will stand at the end of time. They're eschatological <coughs> beings. Obviously, they're participating in the last judgment, and part of this standing at the last times is to make sure that the evil are condemned and the righteous are, well, justified or uh, given their proper due of for righteousness. But anyway, these people in the the bad situation condemn the righteous or make the righteous into sinners and make the sinners into righteous people. They break the covenant. The breaking of the covenant again transgressed. He misses the, this important language also in the letter of James of breakers. The breaking language runs all through here. It runs all through the Habakkuk commentary. And they violate the precept. Nonsense. They violate the law. The word is hook there. The word is hook. And it's not precept. Another vermesh uh, obfuscation. Uh, sort of getting away from the zeal of this group. They band together against the life of the tzaddik. And it isn't the nefesh tzaddik, they, they, against the soul of the tzaddik, they, 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 they banded together, they attacked. They attacked the righteous one. It could be the righteous, generally it could be the righteous one. And they didn't loathe all, though, they attacked. They didn't loathe, they attacked all the walkers in perfection. And they pursued them with the uh, sword, and they exulted in the strife of the people. And the anger of God was kindled against them column two and their congregation so that they were ravaged and all their multitude and their deeds know their works were a defilement before him so we got to an important crescendo there there is an attack on a righteous one here this could be an abstract attack you know i know james uh, is was known as the righteous one in my view this is the attack on james and his community i think it's the early attack in the 40s uh that we get in the uh <laughs> We get transformed in the book of Acts into an attack on Stephen, but that is another long discussion that we don't have time for here. Uh, but we do have two attacks on James in the life of James. One in the 40s, in the Pseudo-Clementines, that attack is led by Paul. Paul literally attacks James in the court of the Pseudo-Clementines tradition, right or wrong, I don't know, and throws him down the temple steps 
in the temple uh, and leaves him for dead in the temple, whereas in fact James was only injured and his leg was broken and his followers carry him down to Jericho, wherein Paul follows him going on his way to Damascus. And at that point, Christian tradition picks up and Paul has his vision on the way to Damascus. He comes through Jericho near here, but he misses James and his followers because they're out in the wilderness someplace doing something. Now that's in the Pseudo-Clementines, and that's incredible material relating James and his followers to this area and this location in some way. And you can say, oh, that's a novel, that's a fantasy. Sure, it's all fantasy. The question is, which is more solid fantasy than, than the others? And I think that is well notice, and it, it behooves looking at whether you want to accept it. it would be a matter of your own taste. A lot of taste goes into this. But if you do accept it, I think we're talking about this attack here. But I don't think at this point that the righteous teacher or the righteous one is killed. And it's important people uh, don't understand there are two attacks, one in which James is injured and another in 62 where he's stoned. But the later one is led not by the liar and his confederates. The later one is led by the wicked priest, that is, by the wicked priest responsible for the death of James. I'll just <coughs> quickly end up here uh, by showing you that the text starts again. Hear now all you who enter the covenant, and I will unstop your ears. And then we get, some of you folks are here from Kabbalah. God loves knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Dot, Chokma, and Bina. So we have it right here in the Damascus document, your Chabad code names here. Da'ad, Chokma, and Bina right here. God loves uh, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. If you know Chabad means... Uh, Chokma, Bina, and Da, they just turned it around from here, it's the reverse, but it's in here exactly. And, um, and then they start a new presentation of the history of Israel. We've had one presentation of the history of Israel, ending in the attack on the righteous teacher, or the righteous one, uh, some very severe attack on him and his followers. We then get another one that starts, and goes all the way through the whole history of Israel. And this leads us in two, three columns, up to column four, where we start moving into the key passages in this document, which are the three nets of Belial, fornication, riches, and uh, pollution of the temple. I'm really going to have to take up that some other time, or next time, or continue next uh, station. It's late enough for you guys, and I appreciate your, uh, your patience. Why not? It's an open ball game here. Everyone sees it with their own perspective. I have just built up the data, and I'm just using the Damascus document here, I assume you can go and read my book, James and Justin, the Habakkuk Commentary, where I take every passage in the Habakkuk Commentary and relate it to the events relating around the life, the little we know about James. Now, you may want to try that with some other character, but I don't think you'll succeed as well, that's all. Sure, it's very possible that we have a whole totally different sociological situation here, but if we do have, then you've got to go to do some fancy stepping to put it in some historical context that might be familiar to somebody. Because as I said originally, I think this is a major movement within Judaism. I don't think it, 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 I don't think it escaped the observation of the contemporary historians. It's just that our understanding of it is defective given that the literature that we have relating to it went through a lot of redaction process that uh, tended to uh, mythologize and change some of, the, some of the meaning of it. Now we have the authentic documents from this movement and I think it is a very, uh, a, 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 as I said, a very substantial one and did not escape our observers. You have to remember, we know probably more about the first century BC and the first century AD than we know about in, in uh, Palestine, thanks to our friend Josephus, than we know just about any contemporary period from the ancient world. I mean, I mean, if you try to think of what you know about the 6th century AD and the 7th century a a AD in Palestine, or if in Italy, for instance, I mean, your knowledge is almost going to be void because we don't have the data to support it. We don't even have data from the Bar Kokhba because we don't have Josephus. Forget the Talmud and the New Testament and all the other documents we have from the first century and now the Qumran text. We have a massive amount of material from the first century period and that has survived miraculously. So, I mean, it may help or hinder us, but you want to start putting this in some other period or some other sociological context, I think you've got to try to identify what that is. Well, Qumran is a society, though, uh, you know, was was uh, was defined by the community rule, and, and people have these you know, these weird habits that, that are ascribed to uh, the people who lived here. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, up in the, uh, in the Kibbutz, you know. So, but but that society had to be 
of the board, you know, of a, of a, it had to have started before this, it had to have gone after, gone after, you know, James. In other words, these people came together for a life in the desert for know. their for their way. Their movement started long before. He I don't know what they did here. I don't know. I mean, who said that's conventional theory you're giving me? I don't know anything about what went on here at Come Run. I don't know what they were doing here. I don't know when they started here. I don't know when they stopped here. I don't know anything about Come Run at all. I just know these texts, and these texts <coughs> give me some interesting doctrines that I'm familiar with from other sources. As far as what went on here, people in little white jackets, that's where uh, Paul Mazursky did to, to give us in his uh, film. But uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know what, what these people were doing here, I don't know how long they were here. I know one thing, that that water didn't come down very often, and I don't believe that life was sustainable here on, in, um, in dry periods. So if they were here uh, for a long period of time, I don't know what they did when there was a dry period. They must have walked someplace else because they couldn't survive in this place in a very prolonged dry period. I don't think they could keep their cisterns full. Jack, he traces the roots way back. I'm sorry? Bob <coughs> Books traced the roots of the movement long before James. Now, what were you going to say, uh, Anna? And what did you want to say? Yeah, did you have your hand up? Someone else had their hand up here. Who else? Have you have your hand up, man. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. James, uh, if I understand uh, correctly, is uh, the brother of Jesus. I don't know that. I don't know. He's supposed to be. He's supposed to be. I, I first have to know who Jesus is before I know who, he, who his brother was, but go ahead. Okay, because it's sort of strange that uh, we be so much importance to, uh, to, uh, to the teacher of righteousness. As James and no reference to Big Brother. Not necessarily. You're just looking at it from the conventional text that you have at the present time. Well, and you're, 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 in the Western world. Why should you? No, but your your texts are telling you that the other brother is the important one. Yeah. That, that, they may not have thought that. We have to look at the world as they see it. You're looking for stuff in their text. Um, the text that you are received. I am saying that we have to set the text that we've received aside as far as an accurate picture of this period. We must go to the Qumran text first because they are the unadulterated eyewitness accounts of this period. The other texts have gone through a transmission redaction process. These have not gone through a very long, if any, transmission, re transmission redaction process. Therefore, I don't expect anything. I don't expect to find Jesus or not expect him. But I can tell you this, that the character emerging here has doctrines and, and details of his life very much parallel to the material we know about James. Now you can say, well, why is James so important? I don't know why James was so important, except for the fact that of all the historical data we have, we know more about James in the first century than almost any other New Testament character from <coughs> sources outside of the New Testament. Why is that? I think the reason is that James was a far more important character than the New Testament, certainly the book of Acts, which does show he's a very important person, by, by, uh, by the way, but most authorities try to avoid this question and don't even get into who this James character was, a much more important a a character than we no normally conceive of. There's more material about James than John the Baptist from uh, other sources outside of the New Testament. There's more uh, than, than Paul. There's certainly more than any other apostle, <laughs> including Peter. There's more, in fact, than Jesus himself, as far as identifying material from third sources that have survived. So I don't see why you get the point of view that you're taking. Only because one text survived, which has played a paramount part in Western culture, yeah. and that has dominated your whole mindset as it has five billion trillion other people. But that doesn't mean that that is what happened in the first century or was dominating their minds. We have to take these texts as telling us what was going on in the first century. It may not be James, as this gentleman is saying. could be a whole, a whole other sociological uh, situation. I happen to think that we have enough data in here to point us very much in the direction of the Jerusalem community in the first century. So if we want to know what they thought about the messianic figure, you've got to go here. It may be that they didn't have the kind of developed concept of um, Jesus that these Gospels and all the Gospels we now feel come from this key source. A lot of people feel that or are related, at least the synoptic ones, one to the other involved in this, in this Q source. So we don't have a three different tr transmissions there. We only have a single transmission plus the John tra transmission plus a lot of spin-off literature that developed after that. But you say, well, how come that was so important? I believe that was a very attractive presentation. Great literature tends to flourish, and, uh, but doesn't mean it is historically precise.
talking things. So why do we have our Jesus here? Well, I don't know that Jesus was the little brother or the older brother or the bigger, more important brother. This group is interested in the righteous teacher who came after the root of planning, the messianic root of planning. They don't tell us much about the messianic root of, of, of um, planning and planting. And at the end of this document, they start telling us about the return of the messianic root. They do have a doctrine of the return of the Messiah. But the Messiah is not their most important individual. At this point, their most important individual is the righteous teacher who rescues them from groping. The Messiah is not their leader. The Messiah is someone they expect to do great things, but the Messiah is not their leader. The righteous teacher is. That's so, all I can tell you. so do you think this is a, a bridge group between Old and New Testament uh, societies, or do you think it's a fringe that No, I don't think it's a fringe lost. group. I think this group was eliminated in the wars against Rome, and I don't know what happened in the Bar Kokhba period, I don't know which side this group was on in the Bar Kokhba period, because we don't have the historical data to tell us. I think this group was eliminated, as all zealot opposition people were eliminated or forced out down to Arabia and became Islam in four or five centuries later, and this group definitely has a lot of links with Islam. And the tradition, I've been able to watch it in the Quran, there's a lot of material coming straight out of the Qumran uh, uh, traditions on into the Islamic ones. And I think these people ran away down that way when they did escape. The others were decimated in the constant warfare that continued on into the Bar Kokhba period and uh, in the Trajan and Bar Kokhba period. And one of the most incredible things is that they had the total annihilation of the Jews in Egypt from 110 to 115, which has been missed completely by all history books because there were no history books written about it. But the, it, but the, but the, uh, the papyrus texts and the ash bins of the various <laughs> archaeological sites of Egypt have given us the material of the total eradication of Jewish life in Egypt, probably because of the Messianic movement moved on into Egypt, where the Romans under Trajan erased it and continued on into the Bar Kokhba period. We had a total erasure of these people. And the only Jews, I hate to say it, who survived were the Jews willing to go the Yochanan ben Sakai route willing to humiliate themselves before Roman power. What does Yochanan ben Zakai do? He applies in the most illegitimate and totally disingenuous way the messianic prophecy to Vespasian. Hmm. That is, to me, beyond the pale. To have done that and that the Jewish people accept that as appropriate and still consider Yochanan ben Zakai their salvation tells you the kind of Jews and the kind of Jewish ideology that survived. This sort of Judaism was eradicated, totally suppressed, as this kind of Christianity, I think, was eradicated and totally suppressed in favor of the Pauline. The Pauline was prepared to live with Roman power and, in fact, advocates Roman power. Romans advocates Roman power. Paul carried a Roman citizenship. You have to understand the tremendous might of Rome at this time and the, and the, and, and, and the implications of that power on the total ideological structure of the groups that were allowed to survive. It's like having the Kremlin in Moscow. Now, in fact, I think the Kremlin was probably less successful than Rome was in suppressing dissident groups. Uh, so Rome suppressed an awful lot of dissident groups, including all dissident groups when Roman Christianity took over, and certainly anything in Judaism that remotely resembled dissidents was stomped down into Kabbalah, and then re-emerged as an abstract spiritualized movement in Kabbalistic uh, terminology as time went on, even Gnosticized. But all these, uh, you know, all these hot-headed groups were eradicated. So again, I, I, I just don't know what happened in this per. But Ben Zakai, you know, wanting to say mainstream Judaism doesn't impress me. Was it was that mainstream Judaism? No, that was no. rubbish Judaism that he saved, and still is. And that's one of our problems. He, it's been heroicized. By the same people that heroicized, and I hate to put it in contemporary terms, the activities of this clique of editors of the Qumran Scrolls. Sure, it's heroicized because the supporters of that kind of a movement survived to heroicize it. But I don't think any person in his right mind would think applying the most precious Jewish prophecy in a totally disingenuous way to a Roman emperor is a heroic act. I think it is an act of humiliation in the most ex extreme kind. And uh, if my people or the Jews don't recognize this, then they don't understand what heroism is or what humiliation is. One of the problems of, of the Jewish people is that they've lived with humiliation for so long that it's become second nature to them. And in fact, I, I don't mean to be cruel, but I don't think that they do understand what humiliation and heroism is. And they don't have any respect for the people who committed suicide on Masada. A lot of people don't.
they try to downplay that as a as an aberrant thing. It may have been aberrant, but it's a heroic act. And to have had yourself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin and 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 and, and got down on your hands and knees and shot an arrow into Vespasian's Bes- 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 camp and said you were a friend of the emperor is an act of the most utmost moral cowardice in those circumstances. And there's no way anyone who is out who who, who judges human action can avoid that. But we Jews have managed to do that for two thousand years. It's one of our that's one of our spiritual problems. No, that's my own view. I'm a I'm a hothead. You must forgive me. <laughs> I don't leave it there. I don't want to argue about these things. We all have different views. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you want to say something uh, before we go? Go ahead. No, I sure did because I wanted to end it. Oh, absolutely. But I have to read you the Quran passage for Passion. We'd have to go through it together. Absolutely. Muhammad in Surah 3. Wait, 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 wait. Muhammad in Surah 3, Surah 3 of the Quran says he knows a group of people of the book who care about righteousness. Huh? The ten Jewish friends of No, 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 no. He says in Surah 3, he knows there are all the people of the book are not bad. There is one group of the people of the book who care about righteousness, who pr- prostrate themselves before God, who do not like uh, fornication and um, riches, and keep vigil the whole night or a third thereof the way he does. So he knows some Jewish Christian type groups who are very similar to earlier. So I'm glad, pardon me. No, well, you were already giving this quote, but I find that the Jewish leader, you're dealing with a text which is first century and Quran is seventh. Side of that, most of the material that we've seen in the Quran is, is essentially stuff which is a gathering that comes from the Quran. We can trace the sources. And we've got a fairly good idea of who got this day that the, 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 the Jews who affected this teaching and affected what is his sources. You'd have to be able to demonstrate the existence of a Quranic, sorry, Qumran type community. I just did. Uh, Continuously for six centuries. Oh no, I don't have to do that. Um, I think you do. No, I don't. Because I haven't finished my statement. Just because you said the pseudo Clementine. We go down through material. We go through. We go through the suit. Not just the pseudo Clementines. We go through. uh, What is that group? um, The uh, not the Manichaeans. They're next. No, before the Manichaeans, there is a group of uh, of the power of the power. They're called the power. They the, what are they? The Al Khazites. You go from the Al Khazites. First, you go. Certainly, Simeon Bar Cleophas is operating into the second century, according to Christian sources, who and I identify Simeon Bar Cleophas. Obviously, the brother of James and probably the second brother of Jesus. But that we can discuss. In any case, the traditional is that he's a nephew or cousin of Jesus. He's operating in the second century, very parallel to Simeon Bar Yochai. If he's an historical character, I don't even know, but there's a lot of parallels between Simeon Bar Cleophas and Simeon Bar Yohai. In any case, this brings us into the, into the um, what was the group I just mentioned, that, Jim, the one we just talked about? The al Khazites who were operating in the 2nd and 3rd century, go on into the Manichaeans. Mani, uh, Mani was a student of al Khazai, we know that. These concepts moved on into Manichaeism, on into uh, Ebionitism, on into Islam. I don't have to, I mean, uh, this is obviously a hazy period because I don't have the documents to, to chronicle it, but I can, <coughs> certainly I made a wild statement there. But just because, let me finish, just because I, I made a wild statement there doesn't mean that there's no substance to it. We're talking in a group in one hour where I'm trying to say some interesting things to stimulate them in, into thinking. If I do what you do and just say, well, there's all these uh, uh, shades and so on, they will not think about that, and they will go away, and they won't. Th- they won't think about it. I'm trying to challenge them into thinking about these things. If you want me to prove the whole statement on one foot? <coughs> I can assure you that there's a lot in the Quran that you can show a link to Qumran style thinking. Whether you have a direct link or an accidental link would have to be discussed. I happen to consider that there is an underground tradition, the same that I consider that Muhammad is very much in touch with certain traditions in Kabbalistic mysticism. He has his spiritual ascents, he has his spiritual journeys, he has his midnight journey to uh, Jerusalem, he has his heavenly ascent and so on. We have a lot of material to show he's in touch with some very interesting traditions. I would only state, to make it more conservative, part of the tradition he's in touch with would be some of these groups that disappeared and reemerged in different form. Because certainly in Gnostic Christianity of 
Hamadi. You have Qumran type traditions that have moved over into a Gnostic sphere and have been Gnosticized. Certainly they changed by the third or fourth century. That doesn't mean that, it, that they didn't come back into the Qumran framework in the first place, but Qumran changes as its hopes for the so-called parousia are disappointed. You had something back there. You can there. trace uh, Qumran style material into the Nestorians as late as the fifth century. Oh, okay. So um, I wrote a book, half of half of a book I wrote, in fact, was tracing this. Which I was the same point where I read the Mandan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Mandan still survived. Yeah. Yeah. Nine yeah. centuries go to yeah. the Mandan. The Mandans are still talking about John the Baptist twenty centuries later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that effect, you had the uh, Nazarites, the uh, Nazarites, in the seventh century. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, agree. Sure. I think it's around today. Both by Jews and by the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. But I have one of the great ones. Hey, take that one before we don't get it in. Huh? It's outside the door. Here. Pardon me. Um, it's someone that is sure. Sure, I mean, yeah, sure. Oh, there's a lot of things that should be done like that. I mean, it's already been in the first place of the church of kings. Well, that would be an interesting thing. So I haven't worked and I'm not been done. I, I don't That's pretend I've done everything on one day. There are lots of interesting things to do. Whether the data is there to work on is we're fortunate to have the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't say we have the kind of data that we, that we need for all these things. Some research work done that our groups in Iraqi living, they call themselves the Essenes, the descendants of John the Baptist, neither Christian nor the Mandans. The Mandans. No, the Mandans. No, the Mandans. Well, what's their name? The coolest. Million dollars more.